Uh, we just want to put it open, so if you have any questions, feel free, uh, fire away, and we'll do our best to answer them as best we can. Um, yes. Easy one. Um, for like, I noticed that you have keys to the game, three different keys to the game for every game. Uh, the youth level, I just coach uh, junior varsity in high school. Uh, are, are there any metrics that you would suggest that I try to track, like maybe kills or something like that? Or? It just depends on what's important for you. I would try to keep it as simple as possible and as fundamental as possible with, with younger guys, younger girls. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, the things that you emphasize for you as a coach and your team, I would just try to be as consistent as you possibly could with those things. So, um, you know, what do you want to emphasize from that team? What are the strengths of their team? You know, when they're playing the best, what are they good at? You know, and, and some of the other things, what do they need to do um, to help them be successful? I would try to start there and then just try to pick out a few and be as consistent as you possibly can. Uh, Bert Joanna, uh, how, like when you're designing drills, like in small sided stuff, do you do it, like how often do you do drills like to get looks from like a specific set or is it mostly like looks you'll get um, I think it's most times based on what we're struggling with in the moment. Uh, in that moment, the one I showed earlier was struggling with ice. He was playing too close to the sideline. So I wanted them to be able to just read it together in that moment. But So it's most times it's based off what we're struggling with in the moment. But if we're just like prepared for the season, it'll just be a mixture of different things we'll see throughout the season. Okay, so are you uh, live track? Uh, so uh, Josh is doing um, live coding the game to pull specific clips, but from the bench, we just with the capabilities of the league, we don't have access to the live feeder. It's okay. not feasible. I'd be too far behind just based on how things are going. So all I'm doing is basically coding what's happening in front of me. So that's why I have a stock game ready to go, just as a, basically a black screen where I, I know I can just input data uh, even though it's not what's happening on the screen. Ian and helps me at home a lot and Josh helps me on the road, they spot me. So I'm actually probably only watching about 70% of the game, uh, just trying to key in, get subs in and stuff like that. So for me, it's really important to have the spotters and just availability for eyes. Like Josh will hear me say, I'm not watching, I'm not watching. So uh, once once he knows I'm, I'm ready to go, he'll tell me like the set, what just happened, contest, paint touch, whatever that is. And so um, I'm basically, I'm, co I'm coding what's happening in front of me behind the bench, which actually works out because then I can give some live feedback to the coaches, the front of bench coaches um, throughout the game. And, and then do you revisit the game after and live? After? Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll recode the entire game afterwards uh, just so I can get specific, because sometimes specific actions won't look the same. Like some of our actions, you know, won't be what was run or like I it just it's jumbled it's hap a lot of it happens fast so I like to go back after the game and I'll do a full code and then that's when we get the I won't I won't provide reports based on what I did live I will go back recode the game and then send them after is that what you do is that standard across the league like the most of the teams in CVL have have a William who's doing, using a similar, same or similar program, providing all that analytics to the head coach, or is this unique to the Seabears? For Ego, I'd like to say it's just me. <laughs> um, I, I, would say, I would say that Fact. William is the best at it in this league. I think what William does is fantastic. When I saw it right away, I'm like, we got to get this guy. Uh, that He was talking with, with Brampton at the time. Uh, and I'm thankful that we got him to come out here and help us. You see all the information he's able to provide. Um, I think other teams are trying to do some things on, you know, an analytic level, but I don't think on a level of just functionality and, and what he's given us. So I think it's, a, it's, again, it's an advantage for our team. Coming here, one of the things we want to do is create as many advantages as we possibly could. Dr. William is one of them. Uh, obviously, rebounding is one of the collegiate uh, uh, skills that translates and that we know if you scout a good collegiate rebounder, he's going to potentially be another good rebounder come up. But 
control levels? Is there any other intangibles or any other things that you look for that might translate as well? I think we look for a lot of different things, but just, you know, from last year in Vancouver, we felt this is a downhill league. So we felt big guards, big scoring guards are really good in the league. And last year it was Jalen Harris in Scarborough, Tony Carr in Saskatchewan. And that's what kind of drove us towards Teddy. We said, hey, we need a primary ball handler that is a big scoring guard because they're good in this league. Um, I think, as we said before, we, we talked about the size of Glenn Yang as a point guard defensively because we felt like we got exploited with smaller guards. So I think you try to look at all of the different situations um, you know, for position and put together a team that's built for the league that you're in, right? So rebounding for us was obviously you want the size and physicality to play big. We've got a lot of teams will be like, oh, we're going to play small. We're going to play positionless. We're going to play, you know, and we, wanted to, we want to have a lineup that plays big on people because that gives us rebounding advantage. It gives us physicality. And that's where you have guys like Chad and EJ, Shane, Simon with his length. Um, but I think that you try to look at what's important to you, look at the league, and then try to pick out some of those uh, intangibles that people might have that can, that can help you. Yeah. How much of your game plan is creating off of, uh, or plays off of what you think they're scouting for? How much of it is just uh, like basing off your advantages that you think you have over their team, as in them taking Teddy uh, downhill away as much as they can, or just sticking with it? So. We will, we have a, as you saw, we have a, a wide variety of things we can do. Uh, obviously, you have to prepare the team to be ready to do those things on the court. We, you know, as, as you saw, <clears throat> Juwan has done a great job of sending, you know, video clips to the guys about attacking certain coverages. Hey, we expect ice coverage. We expect drop coverage. We expect a switch. So the guys will get a short video clip of the expected coverages. Uh, and then what we do is we have a part of our practices in our game prep called game plan sets. And during that time, we will, if we're attacking ice, we'll go through three or four things against ice. If we're attacking switch, we'll go through our thumb up and thumb down stuff. So the big thing for us is knowing the expected coverages, having a game plan for that. But specifically with Teddy, I think it's interesting to see how different teams react to guarding him. We've seen box and ones. We've seen different types of, you know, directing the ball. We've seen all kinds of stuff, full court pressure. Um, we've seen a lot of different things, and it's just like, okay, help him react to it. But in all honesty, Teddy just wants to play one-on-one. -on -one. Like, he turns everything into one-on-one. -on -one. You run a play for him. He catches it. He wants to play one-on-one. -on -one. They guard him in a certain way. He wants to play one-on-one. -on -one. He's just, that's, that's the nature of who he is. So we try to prepare as best we can, but at the end of the day, uh, when you have a talented player like Teddy or some of our guys, they can help you figure it out. One back over there. Yeah, sure. Mike, you talked about building a foundation. I'm just curious, what's the expected? I don't got anything going on. What's the expected roster general from year to year? Percentage well, <clears throat> for us, I think with, you know, last year when, I, when we were in Fraser Valley, we were 8-2, and two, top of the league halfway point of the season. Then we had two guys go to weddings. We had one guy go to Global Jam. We had one guy get called back to his Australian team for, for preseason. We made one roster change because we wanted a different point guard. And all of that came together, and, you know, we got beat in the play-in. You know, so we had these high hopes and high expectations. So the whole mentality this year was, Get these 20 game guys that are going to know how to play together, and that will pay us back. So along those lines, we've invested in certain players, and we'll protect the guys that we feel can help us moving forward. But we've invested so much in these guys, we would love to see a lot of them return or a lot of them come, come back. We don't know where the guys' careers will take them. If they're available, we will have as many guys that we feel are appropriate back uh, because I feel like we've got a great foundation set. Uh, but again, in building the team this year, it was all hypothetical. Hey, come play in Winnipeg. It's going to be great. We're going to have a great player experience, the best facilities, you know, great sports town. Uh, okay, Mike, all right, yeah, okay. Show me, show me. Well, now we can show them. They, you know, we show them the videos. Sold out Canada Life Center. 
great practice field, facility, sport play. David has taken really good care of the guys, so that's going to get around. And they're going to be like, man, I want to come play in Winnipeg. So we will have the opportunity to upgrade the roster, but we also want to respect the work and investment we've put in in the guys we have now. So, you know, we'll see how it plays out. I, I hope we have several guys back. I have a question on the target score concepts. As uh, you guys, I like to actually hear from, from all the coaches uh, with uh, coaching, with all the target score and most of your, most of your coaching careers and now target score uh, concepts, does that change what you do as a coach as you prepare as a team? Ryan, you want to take it first? <laughs> well, I think the biggest challenge with target score is there's no better feeling than hitting a game-winning shot. And the challenge with target score is there's always a game-winning shot. So if you can get your team to buy into staying true to who you are for the previous you know, 35, 36 minutes versus deviating from that and then becoming a complete one-on-one -on -one team, I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, I think one of the things, too, with target score is when do you trigger it? There's not necessarily enough data. I know I've asked Will about this when we started the year, but there's not necessarily enough data about when to trigger the target score, whether you're up by a certain amount or if you're down by a certain amount, are you better off just starting target time and trying to build your lead back versus potentially giving up more possessions where you go down by more or the other team cuts your lead in half. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions still about target time, but it's a, it's a fun way to play. Uh, <laughs> I think the one thing I found unique is the lineup change, right? So our starters most times aren't our finishers once Elam time hit. So that's something we have to figure out through trial and error and data. Through William is just the lineups, right? It's, it's a constant conversation with our coaching staff, like based off the numbers and also just like the feel of the game. We both have to work together to make the whole process work for us to be successful. So for me, that's been like the, the most interesting thing because I've never had to deal with it. Um, they're more experienced than I am, so. Yeah, like in terms of the lineup stuff, it's something we're always looking at. We, the cool thing is being able to do this now in-game is that we have a context for what's happening in the moment. You know, our, there are certain games where our starters are our best group and that's, you know, who we roll up. Roll up. But like Jawan mentioned, 90% of the time that's not the case. And so again, it's being creative with those lineups, understanding also you have to have two Canadians on the floor at all times. So that kind of, you have to be creative with those lineups, be creative with what's happening. And then also, again, there's something to say about coach's intuition versus data kind of before the last game, I know we were all talking and uh, in Vancouver and Steph had given us such a good spark, but we knew that Nick Ward was super aggressive and Steph could foul out. So again, we were planning ahead of time what we were going to do and kind of my recommendation was kind of let's stick bake with how we've played for the last little bit and let's go Shane or Chad. But kind of, again, where the coaching comes into play, it's not always going to be the numbers, is we had trust in Simon because he had built such an equity with us throughout the season. Had that big Elam against Montreal has consistently shown positive numbers where in a time where we're in a bind and we want to kind of close out the game, you know, Contrary to the numbers, we were comfortable going to Simon. And again, in Vancouver, he hits. He hadn't hit a shot all game. Catches the ball off a Teddy closeout. Takes two steps back, bangs a three, and we're off and running in target score time. So again, it's balancing those things. Where it's yes, we do have that data, but the, then again, it's you know we you have to trust who you trust at that time. Uh, I'd say for us, it was an adjustment early on. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember early on, we struggled. Uh, with Elam, uh, finishes either we couldn't keep leads or we would lose leads um, going into it. So it was definitely adjustment for the players to kind of understand their role and not only understand but accept their role. Um, and through this process, I think we all, again, communicated, kept that line open and just explained that keep running our system. Uh, no matter what happens, if we even get through Elam, just keep running our system, keep running the game plan, and then we'll work through it, which we did uh, a few games um, later. And I think that from a coaching standpoint, you know, I love the more control of regular, traditional four quarters where you can call a timeout, you can advance the ball, and you can impact the game. I think it's an adjustment coaching in target score time because you really, it's the player's game. 
you know, you got to get the lineup right, and you got to maybe get some play calls that they're comfortable with. But they got to go get it done out there. So the, the, you know, your team really has to have that maturity and responsibility together. You know, I think that the the target score time, like for the NBA, will be best when it's set for an overtime situation, where they will play the full 48 minutes, and then you know they set a target score for overtime. Hey, we're playing to 11. First team to, to like 11 from this point. I think that'll be really exciting. But I think that there's so much, you know, variability to it that you can, you know, you could finish it in three possessions hitting three pointers, or you could play, you know, a bunch of possessions. I just, you know, for me, it's hard because you play the game one way for such a long stretch, let's say 36 minutes, and then in the last four minutes, it just kind of is. You know, you're just changing the whole way things go. So I think there's it adds a lot of excitement. You have to try to know, you know, how to adjust to it and adapt to it. Uh, but I also think that, you know, moving forward in basketball, you've got to kind of pick and choose the right spots to, to put it in, in play. To that, when you're in the target score portion of the game and you're, you need three, you're ahead, but you need three. Do you all, what's the philosophy? Are you going for the best available shot, two or three? Or it depends what score they have? Or is it we're just going to keep shooting a three to end the game? What's the, what's the strat, your strategy for that? I mean, we would try to execute for the best shot available. We would have play calls, you know, for try to get the ball to our best players, our best matchup, you know. Um, and I think the, the, the time that you're at your strongest in, in target score time is when you're one point away, where anything, just a bucket, a free throw, one point away. So if you're up three and you get a two, that's a great thing. Um, but what, as Ryan pointed out earlier, what happens in target score time is guys have hero ball mentality. They just start to try to get a shot. So if, you're, if you watched our game in Vancouver, the last game, we were – we needed it. We needed it. I don't know how many points, two or whatever. Well, we shot like three straight threes. Just guys just pulling shots like, oh, I'm going to make this one. I got it. Clang. <laughs> Offense rebound. Oh, I got this one. Clang. You know, so this is the whole point. It's that, that system discipline, that team discipline to execute the same way you've executed all game long for good shots. I think that's the team discipline, the maturity that really – and, again, you know, the, the other point is – we weren't very good at, at target score time earlier in the season because we're new. It's just you have you need time to grow together, to learn how to play, to understand. And we'll tell you, there's a couple guys on the team that are hungry for that game-winning shot. They really want that game-winning shot. And, you know, I mean, you shouldn't be playing for that. You should be playing to win the game, you know, not necessarily for you individually for hitting that big shot. But this is the, the mentality that – psychologically that you fight and that I think is going to be so interesting in the NBA when you get these elite talented players in that mindset where they're going for a game winner I think it could be crazy for a little bit I think there could be a lot of bad shots uh, and a lot of coaches going crazy on the sideline you know so along with that you can answer with that one against Sass and got two stops in a row like you know target score five against right Portman EJ got the ball down three, took the two. Was that the possession you wanted there? Or was that EJ going? If you remember, uh, that's a play we call 52. It's a five-out offense, and we isolate the center. EJ's good with the ball, and it's a one-on-one -on -one for him to penetrate. And if you remember, what game was it? Uh, Niagara? Uh, yeah. I think the ball up. Yeah, so the EJ – made his one-on-one -on -one play, and the point was we were trying to get their defense to rotate and pull in. And EJ, if you remember, I think it was the Niagara game where he kicked it out to Jelani for the game-winning three. Is that I, one yeah, of those right. games? He kicked it out, and it was a game-winning three. And so EJ, one of his big steps forward this year has been his ability to put the ball on the floor, penetrate, and kick it out. Well, if you watch the way EJ finished, he went to the basket – and tried to use his body for the old-fashioned and one. Now, he got fouled, but he didn't finish. So we had those two options in mind where he would draw help, kick it out for a three-point attempt, or try to get to the basket and finish strong. Uh, and then, you know, that opens up a whole other question. 
you're at the free throw line, you're down by three going to the line, do you make your first and then miss the second intentionally and try to get the ball back? And to be just honest, we were not prepared at that point with an intentional miss free throw play. So, you know, like, again, we've covered a lot of things. We've done a lot of stuff. But that was not something that we talked about. And these guys will tell you the next day at the shoot-around, you know, we spent five minutes talking about, hey, if we're in this situation, we're going to run this play we call flood. We're going to flood this side of the floor for an intentional miss. Um, so we played it out. Wright Foreman hit a really tough shot. Uh, and that's kind of how it all finished. But, yeah, I think you're always best in just trying to ex em like execute for the best shot possible in those situations. If it happens to be a three, a good look at a three, take it. Well, I think that that's one of the keys to success in the league. I think that you look at the way we built the team, we did not build, we didn't sign players for, you know, competition. We signed players for roles. And when the guys I said before, when they sit in that locker room and they look around and everybody's a little bit different, hey, AJ, you're a shooter. EJ, you're a, you're a powerful 4-5 guy. Simon, you're a stretch four. You know, Teddy, you're, you're the go-to scorer. Glenn, you're, a, you're an organizational big, bigger point guard defensively. Jelani, you're the dy dynamic playmaking point guard. Uh, and on and on. They all looked around at each other, and they all brought different things. I think that helps the roles. But then, you know, you try to connect the guys with different, you know, situations. We try to create a positive environment where guys are enjoying themselves uh, and enjoying the process. So I think that's important. And then I think the other thing is guys are happy here with their surroundings. They've got a really good experience from the organization. David provides for them. They know the standard of the Winnipeg Sea Bears organization is higher than other organizations in this league. The guys that have played in this league on our roster can tell them that. Uh, so I think it all comes together. And then it's just as coaches, just trying to be genuine and honest and direct and uh, building those relationships. So when you value those things, you know, I think you have a better chance at, at getting them right. Talked a lot about like culture, identity, and expectations. Um, obviously, it's a little different, like at the professional level, where guys are being paid. But how do you manage? Like you came in, obviously, with the idea of what you wanted the identity to be, um, the team. How do you manage what your expectations are and what uh, the players are like prepared to offer you? And like deciding whether it's you need to pull them up to what you're expecting or meet them wherever they're at. I think it's always better to meet them where they're at and help them, show them to raise their level, right? I think that's number one. I think you focus on like the intrinsic motivation that players really want to get better and want to do something and, and have fun and enjoy it uh, and then push themselves because if, if it's in their heart and it's intrinsic, they're going to, you know, they're going to develop and improve. But I think, you know, Overall, we can have a great idea of, I want my team to play this way. I want my system to operate this way. But in, in reality, like, we sign players to come here. Like, hey, you're brought in here to do this. In a high school or a college or an AAU or a youth program, it's about helping the players get from point A to point B and develop and improve, you know. So I think it's always better when you meet the people where they are and try to push them along step by step uh, in a positive way. Um, so how does your, so does your strategy change drastically from like the end of the season going into the playoffs? Um, like for example, like I coach JV basketball, a lot of the, a lot of the, towards the end of the season, a lot of people will just like tank, play the players they want to show in strategy, then come into the playoffs, they start throwing someone's and start throwing things half courts, full courts, like things that you've never seen them how do you strategize towards that? Like, how do you strategize against? Um, because everyone knows what you're scouting. Like, everybody's yeah. scouting you out now. Like, well, the first thing is we do our homework, and these guys have done a great job knowing the other teams. Like, you know, our coaches can tell you everything about, like, we beat Vancouver four times. You know what I mean? Like, we know these guys. Um, 
Edmonton, we respect. All these teams we respect. We're not taking anyone lightly, but we know what they do. So if you remember, and I said, I said this story to these guys, the year was probably 2007, maybe 2000, and I don't know, maybe before that, but it was the Mavericks and Dirk Nowitzki. And Dirk was the MVP. And Avery Johnson was coach of the year. And they won their division, and they're the best team, and they're going to smoke the Golden State Warriors. And the Warriors get into that playoff series, and Don Nelson plays his own. And the Mavericks weren't ready for it. So they got the big upset, right? I, what year was it, 2007? 2007? So this was Baron Davis and all those guys. The point is, you have 82 games in the NBA to prepare your team for when it matters the most. You have 82 games to get them ready for whatever situation somebody's going to throw at you. In that case, the Mavericks were not ready. They weren't ready for it. They had no answer for the Warriors' zone, and as simple as that sounds. So one of the mistakes I think CEBL teams make, they wait till the end of the season and load up their roster with five talented guys or three talented guys. Hey, play five games for us and play in the playoffs. Those teams don't know how to play together, and they are vulnerable to that exact situation. They haven't seen it. So what we tried to do is get these 20-game guys that play for our team that know how to play together, and they've had a better chance to get a clear picture. Here's zone defense. Here's box and one defense. Here's ice coverage. Here's drop coverage. Here's a switch. How do we react to these things together? And to me, that's the preparation that you go into the playoffs with. You don't change what you do. You try to use the, the regular season to prepare yourselves for all of those situations that you could face at the end, right? We're not going to change anything. Like, if Saskatchewan loses tomorrow, then we would, you know, maybe we would rest guys or play, play guys maybe not so many minutes. But this is not load management. In, this is summer, CEBL, right? We, guys can play. So we'll, you know, rest them, make sure they're ready. Uh, maybe make an adjustment or two like that, but we're not going to change drastically from, from what we're doing. We're just going to try to do the things that we do as well as we can do them, and hopefully our 20-game guys, our 20 games together will pay us back in these important games when that stress for, for the playoffs comes. Uh, I just have a question about uh, in-game from a coach's perspective. Um, halftime, quarters, like who's doing the talking? Like how do you determine um, who's giving the message? So if you see like in timeouts, we'll, I'll always ask these guys. I ask, hey, you know, what do you think? What about defense? What about lineup? Talk about these guys. They, they'll have all kinds of ideas. They'll come off the bench and tell me something. Uh, there's a lot of times where Ryan or, you know, mostly Ryan subs guys in, just sub a guy in, you know, like he knows, he knows we've talked about different things that we want to try to get done. So we're very much on the same page. Most of the time, I'm in huddles talking and things like this. You know, there may be a time where I've got a TV interview or something like that where one of these guys will take a huddle. Um, but, you know, even though in games, it's most of the time me doing a lot of the team talking. They're talking with, co with individual players and things like this. Um, and I think what we've done with our team throughout the year, our coaching staff, is they all have a voice with the guys. You know, in terms of scouting reports and presentations and things like this, they're all in front of them. In terms of the walkthroughs, Juwan has the offense, Ryan has the defense. So I think we've done a good job of building up all of the voices of our coaching staff in, you know, game time and halftime and things like that. I'm trying to fire those messages, you know, directly as best I can. Um, so, like, if you do want to become, like, a CEBL or, like, head coach or whatever like, one day, um, is there, like, an accreditation that you have to take? And, like, if so, like, is there, like, courses or programs you can't take, and how do I do that? That's a great question. <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, my dad was a longtime coach, and when he retired, he started a coaching program at Clarion University, and the kids, the college kids loved it. And I took it, you know. It was, I mean, we talked about all the stories and stuff anyway, but uh, it was really, really well done. Um, and I think that... You know, overseas, you have, through the federations, you have all kinds of coaching licenses. I'm not familiar with what the situation is here in Canada. Um, Ryan, is there? there Somewhere, yeah. yeah. The NCCP is the uh, licensing body that does that for you. There's a bunch of different levels to go through. Um, they cover all sorts of topics. 
So I would say the NCCP <laughs> for now. And then just try to get as much experience around basketball as you possibly can, you know. He might be. He might be. Then you can spend some time with Simon and Mason. What do you think uh, Simon's ceiling is? So Simon is outstanding. He's so smart. Uh, he's got a good head on his shoulders. He has a fantastic stretch four body. You've seen him as a 19-year-old play against some really experienced pros, really athletic guys, and he's held his own. Um, he's, he's working on a German passport, uh, so I think that he's got a lot of things that teams in Europe will be really interested in. I would love to see him have an opportunity to play in the Bundesliga. I coached in Germany for 11 years. I'd love to see him be there. I'd love to see him eventually get to the Spanish ACB. So I think high-level Europe should be number one. And then we'll see how he can develop with the athleticism. And the one thing about Simon, he's got a great pull-up jumper. He's always open because he's so tall with length. He's just got to work on his body and his handle. He's 19 years old, so hopefully he spends the time well. I think Kirby's going to do a great job with him this year, um, and I'm really excited to see what type of player Simon becomes. But for us, we want him to be Mr. Seabear. You know, he's, he's a great young man. He's got a good head on his shoulders. Um, and he's impressed us with, with his maturity beyond his years. I think that it's important for players to learn how to play and have a feeling for the game. I think if you rely too much on a system and go from A to B to C, then they're going to have a tough time reacting uh, to just playing. So I think it's helping guys understand where their skill set applies in the structure of that system, the structure of the game. Um, so for me, you know, you need to be able to play with detail, execute a system at a high school or college or professional level. I think skills, reading the game, um, just learning how to play in floor space, learning how to you know, penetrate, draw two defenders, just the fundamental parts of the game need to be really emphasized in, um, in youth basketball. Uh, so I think everybody needs to have a system so that kids learn to play with some detail and structure, but I think people need to have those, those fundamental skills to begin with you know, at, the, at the foundation of it all. What do you yeah, I think it's a blend, um, ultimately. You can't lean one way too much. Um, I think, again, you want to keep it engaging for your athletes. So, again, if it's all discipline and structure, there might not be as much fun. Um, that's where you build in some of those individual skills. But again, like Coach said, you want your players to be able to think and play with some freedom and naturally as the game comes to them. I think also um, at the youth age too, at least I see it at the youth sports a lot, kind of Joanne touched on it. Um, if the player's life off the floor is a mess, the basketball won't doesn't matter. It's not gonna. It's not gonna click. So again, teaching them those tangible life skills. You have these kids, as you said, for a number of years. So just teaching them not just basketball, but how to do school, how to stay on top of stuff. You know, things like that. When they do make that leap to you know move away to school to play youth sports basketball or college basketball, whatever that is, um, those are things that really stand out uh, because really the kids that make it and keep continuing to play basketball that are very successful are very smart, they're very intelligent, no matter how talented you get, and there's kids that don't make it just for those simple facts because they don't know how to manage their lives. I think we have time for one more question oh. because we're getting a hard out at 9.30 from the sport for life. You want to say something? I was about to. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, let, let's hear what Juwan has. Let, let's, let's let Juwan weigh in here. No, but um, I spent a year and like a couple months working with like kids from kindergarten all, all the way up to like NBA. Uh, and the biggest thing that I saw with like youth, youth players was like none of them ever had the chance to develop the love. Because every coach they ever played for and their parents always put them in structure. So I'm really big on, especially with youth kids, let's find the love first. So let's come in the gym, I'm bring hella energy, let's have fun, let's do our thing. I'm going to like hold you accountable for your work ethic and more so executing up a skill or a drill. Because at the end, that habit that we're building now is going to last longer than the skill that we're focusing on in the moment, right? So that's my biggest thing, especially with youth players, just developing that love first. Once somebody loves, now we can start drilling in those details, that system, 
then that skill over time is going to come and it's going to be a beautiful blend. And now you see why we loved you on. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs>